there's so much I love about being a chef. It's, it's really is, I think the, the most amazing um, occupation that gives you so much, and it's 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 amazing to see that people in the, within the industry are really trying to push to make it even better as well. Today on Dirty Linen, we are heading to somewhere that I wouldn't wouldn't actually mind clicking my fingers and transporting myself to right now, uh, Bangalay on the New South Wales South Coast to chat to Chef Simon Evans. Simon is originally from Wales, but he is really focused on thinking hard about what it means to cook Australian food. Simon, great to have you on the show. Welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks, Danny. Tell us about what you're doing there at Bangalay. Um, just trying to cook some really tasty food, really, but um, my focus is always sort of um, local, native, wild, what we can get uh, in, in, the, in the local area and what's sort of grown there historically. So, so that's always kind of my focus. So we try and use lots of forage ingredients, lots of wild ingredients, lots of native things. Um, and try and put them on, on the plate in a, in, a, in a way that's sort of recognisable and, and, and delicious. That's always going to be the, the focus of, of whatever you're doing. Whether you, if you have a sort of a, a idea of you want to use these ingredients, you still want to turn them into something delicious. And with um, native Australian ingredients and a sort of a more Western palate, that can be a challenge at some times. So what are some dishes that you've got on the menu now that really sort of speak to what you're doing? Um, we've got... Um, we just trying to we try and use really good stuff. So we've got some amazing lamb. Obviously, spring's coming on the south coast, um, and then just putting it with with some some other sort of local things. We've got that with some with some local seaweed um, that we make a little sauce with. It's almost kind of a, a, a dashi using Australian seaweeds. Um, we've got some some quail with a little pepperberry to kind of spice it up. Um, we've got um, preserved um, sunrise limes. Um, in the sort of same way you do kumquats on a, a little kind of lemon dessert at the moment as well. So we're just, just trying to kind of work in those local native um, and there's always lots of forage things in the menu. We're, we're about 50 metres from the from the beach and from the dunes and there's a absolutely amazing array of, of salt bush and, and turkey rhubarb and pig's face and all sorts of kind of uh, salt tolerant plants we get in Australia um, that kind of are spread across the menu as, as, as garnish and as ingredients. And, I mean, you've been in Australia, I think, for about a decade now, am I right? Yeah, just over, yeah. Wow, so happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a um, wild 10 years. <laughs> tell, us, um, tell us, you know, what you sort of found when you got here 10 years ago, just in terms of the way that Australian kitchens related to native ingredients specifically and, and how, you know, what your thought process was. I mean, we've come a massive way. I mean, I mean, I only really came over here for for what I thought would be a, a bit of a holiday and a, a year on a working holiday visa, and probably I go home then. So I didn't quite expect to to, to spend a decade here and, and, and run kitchens and open kitchens. But um, I, I remember sort of asking the question all the time of like, what's what's Australian food? Um, which I mean, I still ask myself that <laughs> quite often. Um, but people would I get answers from from Shitties to Lamingtons to oh it's sort of Asian food, um, so so I, I never really got an answer for that. And then I, I remember we we got some and and just I sort of just left it there and had, had no um, no information or education about about the sort of the historic history of Australia and the, the culture of um, Indigenous cooking and ingredients. So so I just sort of went about went about my day-to-day -day jobs until we, we got some lemon myrtle in. I remember someone just saying, oh, that's a native. And I was like, oh, okay, there is there is native ingredients then, so cool. Um, and from there, it was just a sort of slow, steady progression. And then I think you'll see right around the time Noma came and um, and sort of Jock was on Frillo doing his thing in South Australia with Irana, that, that kind of became more prevalent. And then we sort of started seeing more and more um, of these ingredients and, and things like magpie goose was, was the sort of uh, the big ingredient of, of 2016, 2015, 2016. Um, so and then became more supplies. Then we get hands on more things and start experimenting and see what these ingredients actually were. But, it, but it's, it's come a, a, a long way. It's, it's sort of stagnated a bit in the last couple of years, I think, um, because of all the, all the logistical dramas we're having. But um, yeah, we're still not quite where where other countries are in kind of embracing their native produce, but but we've we've come a long way in ten years. Um, and I mean, tell me where the, this whole passion for local started for you. I mean, uh, tell us about a bit of the background in Wales. 
Yeah, I mean, so it's funny that the local in the UK is, is quite a different concept to Australia. So like local in the UK is like the field across the road from the restaurant. Like that, that's, oh, it's really local. Um, here it's obviously being a, a much, much larger country. You kind of, it sort of is, is, is within New South Wales. Is that local? And you kind of, well, sort of, like you, you'll still claim that on the menu. So, I mean, yeah, in, in, in Wales, the, the first restaurant we worked out, we were, everything was around us. Like the, the beef was in the field next to the restaurant. Like the cows, you could see the cows from the restaurant sometimes. Um, the, the river we used to get fish from, a, a small part of that flowed underneath the restaurant, which just sounds just ridiculously idyllic now looking back on it and um, probably didn't, didn't appreciate the time as quite as much. But yeah, we, we just used local stuff and it was always empowered to use what was um, what, what grew around us. Um, and I did, did a stage with um, David Everett Mathias at Le Champignon Sauvage in Cheltenham and he, he was kind of really one of the first people to start foraging um, and to make it kind of a big part of his, of his two Michelin star restaurant. Um, and, and that was a big eye opener of how to use wild ingredients in a way that wasn't just tokenistic. What kinds of things would be would you be foraging for at um, Champignon Sauvage? Uh, so, I mean, lots, lots of mushrooms in Wales. It's just like, would just, there's quite a lot of similar things like oxalises and sorrels and um, some wild roots and wood rough and there's some, some kind of uh, very typically named um, British things like hen of the woods and all these kind of funny things like that. But it was just it was understanding what they actually tasted of and actually tasting these ingredients when you were picking them because they do change quite rapidly. Um, and you know, if it's rained the day before, if it's been sunny for a week, these things change. So actually, actually understanding how they taste rather than just picking them and using them um, for the sake of it, actually understanding what their flavor profile is and what they're going to work well with and what they're going to go nicely with. Um, so that they were all kind of spread across the menu, and it was, um, and it's, you know, started with him from a from the sort of the the, the recession in the, the early nineties in the UK of, of not being able to afford these um, expensive Michelin star level ingredients you had you had to kind of have at the time. Um, so it kind of started in the Cesti and then became his 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 thing kind of in the early nineties. So you know, pre Noma uh, foraging um, exploits. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, I suppose some of the bucolic visions of restaurants in the UK that I have include that, you know, someone comes to the back door with a brace of mm. grouse that they've just shot in the woods. I mean, it was, I suppose yeah. there is this sort of heritage of wild foods um, in a place that, you know, we perhaps sometimes think about as quite tame. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that happened as well. We, we, I remember one day, um, a guy who was a, a really a fisherman for us just bought 12 woodcocks, like small little tiny game birds to the back door. And we spent uh, our break between lunch and dinner plucking them in the back. Um, and, and a lot of it does come down to the size of the country. It's a lot harder for for someone to have that you know, closeness to your restaurant where they can just drop them off. So, which is kind of, is a nice thing about being on the South coast where you, you can, we, you know, we do have some of our suppliers, dropping off their produce which is which is nice because we you know we've got it all, all around us but um it's we still haven't quite embraced wild meats in this country possibly because of the the amount of beef the amount of lamb um amount, you know, pork we, we have available and, it, and it's been cheap historically that um and we don't have that history and then also that kind of um you know that 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 racism really towards towards our native wild meats and, and you know kangaroos only becoming legal to eat in, in 1993 i think it was um and there's still like lots of lots of wild birds and things that we, we've got sort of no interest in eating and, and it, you know it took um it, it took obviously like you know, daniel motlop from south something wild and, and richard gunner to re really push to to get you know magpie goose onto restaurants and it's still something that hasn't been taken up so we, we, we don't really have that that need or the want for it so much in this country, which is, which is a bit of a shame, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, one of the reasons, I guess, is um, that a lot of those animals are protected and there is a lot of regulation even now. Yes, we can eat kangaroo, but, um, yeah, it's it's pretty hard to get a licence and to... to and, an, and get to get an abattoir that will process it for human consumption. Mm. I know that's... It's definitely pretty hard in Victoria to get local kangaroo to eat um what is the supply chain for magpie goose 
Uh, so, so something wild who are based in Adelaide, um, they, they're the only company who have a commercial license. They, they wild catch them in, in, in Larrakia country, which Dan and Motlop's from. Um, and yeah, an amazing bird. And I mean, it, it was a, it was a push from, um, you know, from, from the Noma pop-up coming here and, and, um, to, to actually, to actually make that kind of happen really. Um, and yeah, yeah, it, there was a lots of, uh, lots of loop, lots of bureaucracy and and hoops to jump through and, and stuff to fill in which i think was the, was the hard part of it but um so so obviously yeah there's, there's definitely there's definitely barriers um to, f- f- as well as well as the kind of the want and the need and there needs to be supply for there to be demand so there's definitely a, a lot, lots of things in the way um yeah and um i know that that's an indigenous owned business but so much of the native food industry in australia is not indigenous owned which is a massive issue i mean how do you i suppose negotiate that and think about that when you're sourcing indigenous ingredients yeah i think something like i mean i hear big quotes between three and five percent of the um you know billion dollar native food industry actually goes to indigenous people so it's a tiny amount and it's um it's a massive shame because that's where the, the knowledge and the and the sort of context of these ingredients lie. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's difficult. So we do try to um, buy from Aboriginal-owned companies or part of Aboriginal companies um, as much as possible. And we're always trying to keep keep doors open with with people of like if if you produce something or if if you if you can set logistics to get me something like I will buy it. I will use it. Um, like I'll, I will, I will preserve. I'll learn. I'll, I'll, I'll pickle. I'll, I'll, I'll make garums. I'll, I'll take as much as I can, and I'll, and I'll get onto the menu somehow, anyway. So, being kind of open to it and being willing to learn, um, and then seeking out these companies as well. There's kind of um, a sort of a black fishing term of, of companies appearing, just as well. So, so most of the time it's it's talking to to you know people in the industry. Um, to try and find out who, you know, what's the best way to go about supply, but it's it's difficult, and I think the the industry is is kind of retracted as well over the last couple of years. So we were getting much better supply of things, you know, three four years ago than, than we are now. So that's kind of a, a challenge in itself. Mm, yeah, well, I think being sort of ingredient led is is really important, and definitely, mm. I suppose. Um, if you've got that flexibility in the way you create menus and and cook, then it's easier to be responsive to what people are able to provide, rather than feeling like you just need to yeah tick stuff off an order sheet and have that consistency that re- so many um, restaurants and chefs are, are used to working with. It's just a different dynamic, yeah, isn't it? Just this kind of conversation I have with suppliers all the time, and I try and, and there's always that that push and pull of like I I want uh, you know. I want a hundred racks of lamb a week, but I'm trying to work with small suppliers who aren't processing that to me lamb. So it's like, okay, I'll use half of that. And then I'll need some shin as well to bulk that dish up. So it's all kind of that, that back and forth of, of what, what they can provide and what, what I want and, and sort of trying to meet somewhere in the middle that kind of works for everyone. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's so interesting because of course, yeah, the, the lamb does have a shin as well. So it probably makes sense. Um, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, back to magpie goose, um, you know, most people probably haven't tried it and wouldn't really have much of a sense of what it's like as a, as a, as a product. Can you give us a bit of insight? Yeah, so um, my restaurant Kavo in Wollongong that we, we closed after COVID, unfortunately, we, we had, I think we were sort of only one of the only restaurants at the time using magpie goose, um, so that's whole birds anyway. Um, and that, that was from building up a relationship with the guys at Something Wild and, and um, you know, getting them down here and we do dinners together and take going up foraging together and things like that. And then we sort of got a, a good weekly supply of it. Um, but yeah, it's the name probably doesn't help. I think we there was someone wrote an article about us one time and said that we serve magpie, comma goose, and then something else. So <laughs> it hasn't been um, maybe not the best name. And people are like, is it a magpie? And it's it's a it's a it's a goose uh, with sort of black and white plumage. Um, really gamey, really lean, really dark meat. Um, very little fat on it absolute nightmare to cook um, it like goes from being completely raw to to being like a, a bunch of bands in, in seconds um so but we really wanted to put it on the menu um we really wanted to use it 
uh, so we sort of managed to work out ways between between lots of lots of brining and salting and smoking and cooking over coals and um, and, and various ways to to use every, the whole bird up as well so that the, the, there's nothing on the wing there's, there's barely any leg to it so we're making sort of sausages at the leg um, but so it's an amazing flavour and it really kind of sm- it really sort of smells and tastes of Australia it's got a real kind of um, native uh, like sort of wild herb kind of native thyme. Um, uh, it's almost like eucalypt kind of taste and aroma to it. It really, really sort of, it's got, it's almost got tewa, um, to take a word from the wine, the, the wine industry. Um, so yeah, it, it's such an amazing taste and such a, it was such a sort of privilege to be able to serve it as well. Um, and again, I think, yeah, price logistics supply, and you don't really see it much anywhere at the moment. I think that whole idea of tewa when it comes to, um, ingredients is something we're going to be speaking a lot more about. I mean, it's, um, yeah, the food that's grown in different places tastes tastes like the place. And I've, I've definitely heard it, uh, you know, people speak of it more with grain recently. So I feel like it is a conversation we're going to we're going to keep having. So, yeah, it's nice to hear you speak of it like that. I guess especially like the, the guys that saw Black Duck Foods doing, I'm sure if you're aware of those guys, um, like with all the native grains as well and, and you know, things that are sort of supposed to grow in this country. And I guess, yeah, you can almost, you can talk more about tewa, with things that are sort of uh, that don't have to be forced to grow in this country. Simon, let's talk a bit about Bangalore and you know the fact you know their villas, people stay there. What's it like, sort of looking after um, food for people who are coming specifically to eat, or people who are there for a different kind of experience, perhaps just there to relax or um, you know have a massage every day or whatever people do when they've got that kind of time and money. Yeah, yeah I know. What, What's what the, do people do when they have time off and relax? I don't know. I don't it's know. Weird. I, I, no I, idea. I've heard about it. But, yeah, it's, it's um, the wrong, wrong type of podcast for that, isn't it? Hospitality podcast. Yeah, what's the, <laughs> what's the dynamic there with creating menus and feeding people? Um, there's always a balance. It's amazing to have the obviously have the rooms because we're in a, a you know fairly secluded spot. Um, so the idea of sort of restaurant with rooms regionally, I, I think, works really well because it's the it's, you know you. you Access is the, is the is the half the problem with the regional restaurants. So having rooms on on site and, and houses in the village is amazing. But obviously that does bring that that broad customer base where some people um, book a stay because the the rooms are beautiful and then the and the, the sort of the the area, the area is amazing. So and then maybe don't know there's actually a restaurant there. Um, so it, it's definitely having that that balance. Um, and and we do that by. By keeping our food um, si- simple, but u- using those amazing ingredients and using them well, and having them to, uh, recognizable. Um, also, we, we have a tasting menu and a la carte menu, so we can sort of go a little bit more crazy on the on the tasting menu because we know people who are who are willing to sort of commit that that amount of time to dining are, are more keen to try some of those things. So that's where we'll have um, some slightly more out there ingredients and some techniques on. Um, and with the other carpet, we're just trying to keep it really simple and said like delicious um, and using local things. So we've we got a, an amazing dish. It's about to come off the menu, actually, but it's um, some local uh, Wessex Saddleback pork loin, so a sort of heritage breed, so much slower growing, really amazing fat content and just really tender meat. And, and we, we sort of treat the loin with, with a bit, bit, of, bit of sous vide and we roll in some porcini powder and sear it off. So it's, we're trying to just make the best pork loin that someone's tasted because people always cook pork loin at home and ruin it um, because it's quite hard to cook and it can be quite dry. So it's, it's almost like a, it's, it's a easy win for us if we can cook it and we can nail it. Um, and then we just got some, some kale that we just sweat off some local mushrooms from Nara and, um, and a little broth. So like really simple, but just really highlighting the, the, the amazing local ingredients. And I, and I don't, I don't see how anyone could not enjoy that dish as picky as you might be. It's, it's simple. There's, there's beautiful ingredients and they're cooked well. So as long as, I think as long as you stick to those core aspects, then people should be able to access your food, no matter if they're there just to relax or if they want to come and spend two and a half hours doing a degustation and, and match wines and, and hang around afterwards. So, so as long as it's kind of kept, um, in the context of good food, I guess. Mm. Well, how do you feel that regional New South Wales is going? I mean, you mentioned you've closed one restaurant 
um, due to the pandemic um, and you're there a couple of hours out of Sydney. Uh, you know, how is it feeling? You know, people are talking about staffing, especially in regional areas, being really tough. Um, yeah, what's the landscape like in your opinion? I think it's it's it's, it's double-edged right now because we're getting more we're getting sort of the limelight shone on us more and it's great to see um you know good food and publications looking outside the cities more which is sort of always been our bugbear in regional especially in Wollongong being sort of so close to Sydney we, we almost get overlooked for not being regional enough um but uh so so it, it is amazing to see that the south coast getting a sort of a light shone there um but then there's so you know we, and last summer last two summers we've been been so busy and if it wasn't for um, so extra lockdowns and restrictions, we, we'd be, be you know, calling this the, the sort of great resurgence of, of, of regional dining. But then we've got the staffing issue, which is not going away anytime soon, it seems. Um, is is get, becoming almost a parody of whenever you see anyone from the hospitality industry and who've been to a couple of award things, it, it's it's straight on the staff question. And that now people, it's just kind of like, staff, yeah, bad. Okay, cool, let's talk about something else. Um because it's it's becoming like we're just having the same conversation of staff's hard day eh? and like, yeah oh god I can't get, I could do some more staff you like get staff and that's, that's the, the whole conversation so I think we're all getting a bit bored of it now um, so that that's tough um, it's going to be tough for some time I don't see any short term solutions to it so it's it's about working other ways and, and we're sort of putting a lot of energy into our training um, and and expecting us to have you know, quite young staff coming in with, with no hospitality experience. So really starting from the beginning and starting from the real basics and, and not assuming people have that basic hospitality knowledge of, you know, this is where your knife goes, this is where your fork goes. We, we've got to sort of start from the, really from the ground up and, and get those sort of training schedules in, in into action. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it is what it is, but um, we've been pretty lucky that we've managed to keep a, a really tight, um, core in the kitchen especially um we've had people come and go but when the people have kind of kind of come and gone they've they've gone to some really good restaurants in sydney or canberra so we can't be too too mad at that that we're you know sending people on to to sort of uh to other other great restaurants mm. and you you mentioned that you weren't expecting to spend all this time in australia when you first <laughs> got here i mean do you reckon we've got you for good now i mean would you consider yeah I yeah, yeah. I, I mean I, in the context now i only spent four years cooking in the uk so uh, and it took me so long to just to remember to say eggplant and not <laughs> not um Oh, what you, I guess I can't remember the other way anymore. Oh, that's um, awesome! You're oh, aubergine like, free zone. Aubergine, yeah. I was, I was like, I was, I was thinking all like courgette to zucchini. So it took me so long to do that. And I remember coming here and being like, "Oh, all the fish is different as well." I'm like, "What well, is a barramundi?" Like, so I feel like I've I've, uh, I've taken the time to to learn all these things now. If I went back, it would just be I'd just be a 35 year old who didn't know what an aubergine was. So, so I think I'm stuck here now. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> so I mean, you know, we I guess we're not we won't bang on about staff because everybody is but it is unless you have any solutions uh, no, no no you're the one you you need this you need to give me the solutions so we can share it but um i mean i suppose that aside if we can put it aside how are you feeling about the summer to come yeah good um it's the obviously winter regional for everyone is a bit quieter so is that that time to you know, it's time everyone kind of takes a bit of holidays and, and try and relax, but then you, you try and focus, especially being regional, especially with accommodation. We know that from November onwards, we're, we're pretty much full in the villas. That means we're going to be pretty much full, or we are going to be full in, in the in the restaurant. Um, so like I said, it, it's putting those things into place now with the you know, systems and procedures, um, the training of the staff, um, and, and just getting everything ready, you know, getting our menus ready, getting our producers, even the logistics of getting produce to a regional restaurant is 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 hard in itself. There's you know only certain people who will deliver down to us, and we've got to balance between you know local suppliers and the sort of bigger suppliers who can cater for the, the size of restaurant we are. So there's there's all sorts of little little nitty gritty things that the um the, the things that actually make up a chef's job not the the sort of master chef view of of getting a box of produce magically appear on your on your bench every day and making dishes so it's all those little nitty-gritty parts which um 
which is, is not the most fun part, but it, it means you can you can run your restaurant in the busy period and, and enjoy it and, and, and produce nice food. So it's just all that planning right now. But yeah, we're, we're really excited. Um, Ever changing landscape, especially with uh, international travel opening now. Um, we'll see how, what what difference that makes with domestic tourism, and then we'll see what um, international travel can have into Australia as well. So, sort of a lot of pressure on 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 local tourism to really to really push that and to um, and to make sure that we're, we're getting we're getting people into the area, um, and then we'll do our best to feed them. Yeah. Well. Last summer just got so messy that I really yeah. look forward to something that's a little bit closer to normal, if there is ever normal again. Yeah, um, just be a bit of consistency of, of you know not not worrying about having to, might having to cancel something. I think that was everyone's worry. It was very last minute, and we, we were going from ten bookings to fifty bookings in in in, in, a, in a day last summer from memory. Yeah, it was a, it was a problematic blur um yeah. simon let's finish can you tell us what you love about what you do what do you love about being a chef um i, I really love so much about being a chef and um and then uh, then also i love to complain about <laughs> being a chef as well um but i i, just, I think it's such a, it's such an amazing job i i really well, you get some chefs who kind of want to be out in the kitchen by the time they're 50. I'm like, I hope I'm still in the kitchen at 50. Like, I, I want to still be on the pans. Like, it's still, like, my favorite thing to do is, like, is to just, just do do a do a busy night um, cooking. So, like, yeah, just being, being like, that close-knit, constantly learning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm super curious, and I, I always want to learn stuff. I'm always reading stuff, so, and it's never-ending between between food and and the wine side of what I do as well. It, it's there's always something to learn. Um, the, the the closeness with with your staff members, seeing you know staff members grow and coming from someone who you know can't peel a potato to them running a section just gives you such a kind of um, a blast of pride. Um, the I, I like the hours, like I'm a night owl, so I, so I like I like being up late. Um, you know, I, I like the franticness of it. I like, like solving problems. There's, there's so much I love about being a chef. It's, it's really is, I think, the, the most amazing um, occupation that, that gives you so much. And it's 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 amazing to see that people in the, within the industry are really trying to push to make it even better as well, and to try and really kind of file off those those bad points that we've had with, with sort of underpayment and. Um, and, and overworking and things like that. So, I mean, and, and that's an amazing thing to see as well. I don't see too many other industries advocating for themselves um, quite so much from from things, you know, from you know, groups pushing uh, more awareness of, of sexual harassment and and, and, um, and harassment in the industry to underpayment, and that, that all kind of comes from within. So that gives me a massive sense of pride as well of of our own industry kind of taking responsibility and, and pushing forward. And I, I really don't see that in other industries. Yeah, I love it. So, so many um, threads that um, you're, yeah, hanging on to and running with. Um, so great. Uh, Simon, it's been, yeah, a real pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for coming along for a chat and, yeah, wish you a great summer in Bangalore. Awesome. Good. Hope to see you down there on time. Definitely. Thanks, Danny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.